Hello, it's another day and we are going to still talk about addiction and drugs and just what going down the wrong path means to a lot of people, but it is possible to change. And I'm Brenda, another thing from Things by Bren today, and we are meeting with Corey Fox. Corey has got a story that is just unbelievable because not only is he giving back to the community, he has completely changed his life around. He has uh, spent a little bit of time in county jails, never did go to prison, but now he is mentoring. He has taken his life from a point of drug seller to user addict to turning his life around. So Corey, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what's going on in your life. Right. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share my story first and foremost, giving honor to God and everything. But um, my life was just like any normal kid life growing up. Uh, when I say normal, like we all had hopes, we all had dreams that we wanted to do, we you know, as we coming up. But in the moment of that, when I was born, you know, my dad had left, my mom. Mm. And um, so I never really got to have my dad in my life. And, but I got to have some type of male in my life at that early age for me being three months all the way up until I was like seven, eight years old. And he taught me through that time, even though that I really didn't understand it at that time, but he was taught, taught me how to be respectful, uh, what it was to have a caring family because we lived in Omaha and those mm -hmm. were the best times of my life is that because we had structure and I seen what a family was like at the early age. But then when my mom and my stepdad, they split up at that age, then I moved back to Topeka around at the age of eight. I didn't have that anymore after that. So your whole structure, structure just collapsed. Just collapsed. And, uh, and then my real dad wasn't in my life. And then the stepdad, he was, he was there a little bit, but he lived so far away. And so then it kind of just faded out a little bit. And um, now I was on my own. And then as far as without no father, no male role model. And then my mom, when we moved back, she was there, but then she was in and out because she had some issues that she was dealing with. So mostly I was raised by my grandmother. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was raised by my grandmother and wonderful woman, bless her heart. God bless her souls. You know, she passed uh, a, a year ago and um, she, um, she raised me and she showed me as far as, you know, getting up, going to work early, but she worked so much. She worked from 4 a.m then she would, wouldn't be back home until like six in that evening. So I had all this day. time. Yeah. And I had all this time and to do whatever that I wanted to do because I really didn't have that, that male role model there, no structure there at that time, no more after that. So what started you down this path? Did you meet somebody? Uh, were you in school and you just fell in with the wrong crowd? How did it all begin? That's a great question, and, and it's like, when I got to the middle school, elementary school, I did wonderful, all the way up to sixth grade. I always liked elementary school, did great in elementary. Then when I got into middle school, I played basketball. I mm -hmm. loved to play basketball, made the 18. I was a great guy. You know, people seen stuff, oh, he's going to be great. And, you know, and then I heard some people on my side of my family saying, oh, you're going to be just like your dad. You ain't going to be no good, you oh, know. Man. And, and so I'm hearing both sides, but I always in the back of my mind is like, I'm saying, I'm going to show everybody. I'm going to show everybody that, that, that I'm, I'm going to do something great. Because I was quiet, never really hung out with a lot of people. I never really hung out with a lot of people. I was just by myself. Mm -hmm. And in the seventh grade, played basketball. But one, one thing that I, I really got sad about was when I'm playing basketball and I'm seeing all these other people's families in the crowd cheering them on and after the game they're leaving with their family their moms and, their dads and, and i didn't have that mm -hmm. after that i would walk about two blocks home you know by myself you know and i because i never really hung out with a lot of people and i had one particular friend and that's who i would hang out with every day you know every day and eighth grade came that's when things started going down going downhill I just felt alone. I just felt by myself. You know, I just felt like, you know, there wasn't nobody there for me. And it's kind of strange because nothing really triggered me. It was just like, 
I just wanted somebody to be there. You were lonely. You know, I was lonely. So what, what gave me satisfaction was I was handsome. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was a handsome guy. I had the dimples and a lot of, a lot of girls did attract to me. So that's where I found my happiness or being with women and talking mm -hmm. to women. And that's, that's where it all started, you know? And then I really fell in love or in lust at an early age, you know, my eighth grade year going into my ninth grade and she broke my heart. Mm. It happens. And it happens. And mm -hmm. I think that then after that, I just didn't care anymore because I'm like, man, she's not there. My mom, not there. My dad's not there. So it was like, wasn't nobody there. And I was since I was looking for love or somebody to care for me and be there, you know, because my mom wasn't there or my dad wasn't there. So I'm looking for that. And then when that happened, then I'm just like by myself. So I just started hanging out, mm -hmm. you know, just started hanging out or going to this girl from this girl, from that girl to this girl. And now I'm hurting other people, other females, because I'm with you. But then I got another girl now because I was afraid of getting hurt again. So you were putting up walls. I was putting up walls. Mm -hmm. You know, I, so who, who introduced you to selling drugs? And at what age did you start that? I started selling drugs about when I was like about 18 years old. Because I had dropped out of school in the ninth grade. Dropped mm -hmm. out. Dropped out of school. Uh, then my mom and my grandma would tell me I would have to go to a different school. I went to a different school. Didn't do great there. Then my 10th grade year, I just really just like, I never did go. So mm -hmm. the, counselor, the counselors and them got together and they wanted me to go to Job Corps. So I went to Job Corps in St. Louis. And okay. I learned a lot in St. Louis. That's where I got connected with some of the affiliation of, of different gang members when I was in St. Louis because at, back in the 80s, St. Louis was real rough. Right. There's still parts yeah. of it that's rough. Yeah. And, and that's where I really kind of seen a lot more down there at that age. And then when I came back to Topeka, that's when I got into the introduced to the drug game is because my neighborhood, people that I knew that my mom and other people that I knew, my uncles and all them, they were all, you know, part of the drug thing. So uh, I didn't have no money. So I started selling drugs. And you got some money. And I got some money and I got some money. And, and, the, and the thing of it is now when I'm like 20 years old, I get a good job. I get a good, good job at Hill Science and Technology Center. I get a good job and I'm working and I'm, I'm at 20 years old and I'm making about, at that time I was making about $15 an hour, full benefits. This, this was and back in the 80s? This early is back 90s. in the 80s. Yes. Early 90s. Yeah, mm -hmm. early 90s. I say about 95, about 94, 95. And I'm making pretty, pretty good, good money. money back then, especially back for then. somebody that didn't graduate. Uh -huh. for, and I didn't have no high school diploma or anything. Mm -hmm. and, and I still had that hustle with me. I, I just, I was a great kid, but I was just lonely. And mm -hmm. I'm just doing things just because, you know, I just wanted to do them. And that sounds bad or sad, but. I just wanted to do them. Well, the and truth was, is the truth. Yeah. And, and as I'm selling drugs and I'm working, and then the next thing you know, curiosity came in. Like, what is this drug doing to everybody that I'm selling? And I'm watching my uncles and my mom and everybody around me and her friends that they work with. They, I'm selling them drugs. Wow. How hard or easy or what was it like to get the drugs to sell? Was it easy? Was it readily available? Yeah, it was real easy because the guy that was, well, you know, that had the drugs, you know, he was friend of the family. So I'm, I'm around all this. I'm around all this. And so just asked me if I wanted to sell drugs. And I'm seeing how easy it was. Mm -hmm. And I just said, yeah, I do it. Just not even thinking. And that's what we have to do sometimes as kids and when you're lonely and you see your mom ain't around that much or your dad's not around and you just really just living for yourself and you're, as you go, you're learning. 
you're learning and you're making mistakes because you're just going off of impulse. You're just going right. because you really don't have no direction. You didn't have those things instilled inside of you for you to say, no, nah, I'm not really going to do that. You know, that could give me some jail time mm -hmm. or this, you know, you just, you doing it because either you want to fit in or you want something for yourself that you couldn't get, you know, like money, shoes, clothes, right. you know, so you, you want these things and you just thinking nothing will ever happen to you or man. Yeah. I can make a little bit of money here. And then I can stop and then I got my job here. You know what I'm saying? I, I ain't going to never use. But that wasn't the case with me. Yeah, you started using. I started using. And I started using because I'm thinking that everybody that I was selling to, I knew. And they were older than me. And I'm seeing them and I'm watching them go to work. I'm watching them still pay their bills. I, they just seem like they're normal. Like, you know, every day. Mm -hmm. But little did I know that over time, when I first tried it, over time, I was still doing good. I was still selling, and I was still, you know, getting high. So when and you say getting high, what kind of drug? First off, what did you sell, and then what did you use? I was selling crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. And that's a deadly drug. Right. You know, and I started, then I started off putting it in weed. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They call them primos. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and, and I started off doing that and it would be like, I was cool. You know, I feeling happy. Like I wasn't worried about anything. It took away a lot of the things that was going through my head, the pressure that I was feeling like I have to do good because people are already saying my daddy ain't around. My mama ain't around. I ain't going to do, I ain't going to be nothing. They were you know already judging saying? you and you hadn't they, even grew up yet. I haven't even grew up yet. And then when I started doing that and then, you know, started drinking and that drug, what, after a while, over a while, that was like, oh, that ain't doing that. And I need something stronger. And that's how it happens. You start off with one and then pretty soon you're like, oh yeah, I can handle that. I, I need something stronger. And you watching everybody around you still doing functioning and doing this. So curiosity hit me. Mm. And people told me, man, that drug could take you under. But I never seen nobody that that it really took under. You hadn't witnessed it I until, witnessed until it. until it happened to you. Until it happened to me. Mm. And it didn't just happen to me right off the bat. You know, it was slowly but surely it was taking things away from me. And then I was working at Hills and I found myself calling in, getting high all night, still going to work. But then after a while, I was calling in. So you weren't reliable anymore. I wasn't reliable anymore. Then I find myself taking stuff from them. Like the dog food and saying, oh, I can get money. Because now I'm not even selling no more. Now I'm just looking at a person. Me, I just want to get high now. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how long did you use? 15 years. And you've been sober about five? Five years, five so and a half. you've got a 20-year history with with drugs actually longer than that because of the family members and the gangs and, and things yeah. that are, that were kind of pulling you towards it. So you were kind of setting yourself up as a youngster, but didn't really know that at the time. Didn't really know that. And I thought that I could be like the drug dealers that have money and get money and do all these wonderful things. And little did I know that I was setting a trap for myself because I wasn't strong enough to say no. So how did you get off of it? What happened? Well, one day I was just, you know, it was just getting to the point to where I never had anything. I wasn't having anything. And I was trying to rob Peter to pay Paul and then think about, I was hiding it. You know, a lot of people didn't know that I was getting high. I was hiding it. I was what you call them closet smokers. Like mm -hmm. I could function. Like I could really, I could actually function it do this and making sure this is done and that done, but I couldn't stop getting high, but I was functioning, you know? And, and so when I'm getting around other people, they wouldn't know I got high because I wouldn't allow them to know that. And I would portray to be this person, but then actually then I would go and be this person and go get high. I was like, I was two different people. Mm. I've heard that a lot that you become a different person. Yeah, I was two different people. Like a lot of people, if I like today to now, when I tell my story now, 
I never knew you got high, Corey. I never knew you was on drugs. But the truth is that I would just go get it and I would sneak in, come back home. And that's the worst thing that you can do is get high and, and hide that from other people. And you ever heard of that saying that says secrets keep you sick or secrets make you sick? Yes. Mm-hmm. And that, that there's is a lot true of truth because to there's a lot of truth to that because you think it's a secret that don't nobody know, but they really know. They just ain't said nothing to you. Mm-hmm. You think you know, they don't know, but they, in reality, you, they know. They, they know. Well, they suspect it. Yeah. And my, my, my girlfriend or my wife that I'm with now, I did a lot of things and, to, you know, just hurtful things and just being staying out late and, 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 and not coming, you know, coming home, but coming home at the wee hours of the morning. And I had five kids. I got five kids by Ooh, her. That's a lot of kids. Yeah. I had five kids by her and I was just seeing how I was taken away from them, but not being there. And it was just hard. It was just, it was just hard because I would come home and they would look at me and then they'd be like, daddy, you, are you leaving again? Are you going to be here? So your you know, kids were say, starting to question you. Just question me, you know, and I had made a commitment when I was 20 years old though, before I even had kids, I didn't have my first kid till I was 28. And I had to go back there because I had made a commitment to God when I was 20 years old. And I had told him, I said, God, if you ever allow me to have kids, I wouldn't do them the way that my dad did me. Did you? Mm-hmm. I would be in their life because I know I knew how that felt of not having a dad around. Right. And my first son that I had when I was 28, I thought that that was going to change my life. I thought that that was going to change me from doing the drugs and mm-hmm. get me back on track. And it did for a while. But I was so far in it, so many years in it, that it would kept calling me. It kept, I, I couldn't just stop. I, I just, you just couldn't stop and turn it off like that. You know, even though how much I tried, I couldn't do it. And then I had another son. And then I had a daughter, you know? And then I ended up wow. having these kids. And it was just so hard. And I wanted to stop. And it just seemed like I couldn't stop. So did you go to a program to help you or, or what, what did you do to help stop? I went to a program when I was working at Hills. I, I went to a program when I was about uh, 30 years old. I went to a program. And when I went to that program, it was called uh, Valley Hope. Mm-hmm. And I went to that program and because I wanted to keep my job at Hills because I knew that I was finna lose the job at Hills because I had been calling in. Right. And I wasn't going and I was calling in. So some in my mind said, hey, you know that if you go and tell them that you need help because you're an alcoholic and you're on drugs and stuff, that they would have to give you that FMLE leave and they would have to mm-hmm. send you to a rehab. So I used that to my advantage and I did that. And when I went there, I got clean, did my 30 days, got clean, I came back, I was good. I was good and I, I, uh, I, I stayed clean for about a year. Something triggered me. Uh oh. They say everybody something, has a trigger. Something triggered me and it was in a relationship and we got into an argument and it triggered me. And then at that moment, I said, forget everything again. And I started using again. Mm-hmm. And then from that point on, I continued to use and I continued to use. But this time, when I wanted to get off drugs, I just dropped to my knees because I knew I was getting out of hand. And these other five kids that I had, and, and then with, even with the rest of my kids, I knew that they knew that their dad wasn't right. I knew that, and I felt that. And then I felt the commitment that I made to God. And I was like, man, I'm being just like my dad. Even though I'm here, I'm not here. You're not there, you know? right? Because your not, your mind is somewhere else. Your your focus mind. and your attention is elsewhere. Right. And I tried to fake it like, oh yeah, look, and then do things with them and take them to basketball practice. I was even coaching basketball. But after I would do all that, I would go back and start using drugs. 
And look, it got to the point that I was still doing drugs, but I would still go to church. Right. I'm, I'm going to church and I'm still doing drugs and I'm asking God to take this away from me. Take the taste out of my mouth. Take, the, take everything away from me. God, I don't want to be like this no more. And it comes to the point, I was so much playing a role that I was even sitting in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And then I would leave the church and leave the pulpit and I would go get high. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people have, have uh, a double life, pretty much. And that's what I was living. And I just got tired of living that double life. I got tired of disappointing people. I got tired of making promises to my kids and then breaking the promises, you know? And then, then my wife now that, I, that I'm with now, she, you know, she was getting fed up. She was gonna leave and, and, and everything. And I was just seeing how many people I was hurting. And the most, the, the most part that got to me was when I was hurting my kids. Right. I was hurting my kids. And I was like, man, I, I kept feeling, I was feeling the shame. And then there was a point to where I didn't have no money. My bill was about to get cut off. And th the story was, I, my bill was about to get cut off. And I had to go ask somebody for the money. And I knew the person that I was going to ask me, why? Why do I need it? And, and, and why don't I have it? You know, because I was living that double life. Right. I made it seem like I made it seem like I had stuff, but I really didn't. Right. And they came to me and they was like, when I asked them, they was like, I do it for you, but you gotta promise me something because I love you. It was my baby brothers. He mm -hmm. said, Because I love you. He said, But my help's gonna come with some conditions. He said, Now, if I help you pay this bill. You got to promise me that you will stop hanging around the people that you're hanging around. Change your environment. Change my environment, and I will stop using drugs. He said, if you can tell me and you can do that, then, you know, I'll pay your bill for you. So I made that promise to him. And one thing about me as a man, if I make a promise to you, I keep that commitment. That's good. You know, there's, there's I try more of that in the world. I try to keep that commitment. So I was tired anyway, and I wanted to, you know, and I had asked God, God, if you get me through this one, you pay this bill for me because I didn't want my lights to get cut off because I never right. had my lights cut off. I got kids in here. And so he made, he paid it. And then after that, like for real, I just started praying to God. Mm -hmm. That's the honest to God. I just, I didn't need rehab. I didn't, it was like, I, after that, I never went back. Isn't that once wonderful? I gave him, once I gave him my word, I never went back. He paid that bill. And I said, man, bro, I'm, thank you very much. And I'm going to keep that word. And I'm going to make sure that I don't do that. And every day that I got up, I said, God, please take that taste out of my mouth. Take those thoughts out of me, you know, and, and, and just help me become who you allowed me to, to become who you want me to be, who you ordained for me to be. He can definitely do that. He can take the cravings, he can take the wants, and he gives you what you need Yeah. in, in and, exchange for that. Mm -hmm. so, and even, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and even in the midst of me doing all these drugs and selling drugs and drinking alcohol and messing with this woman and that woman, I always knew in the back of my mind, though, I kept telling my friends that I was, even getting high with and drinking with and partying with, I used to tell them, I said, man, look, God, I'm not going to be like this. This is not my, this is not who I am. And they used to look at me and say, no, no, you ain't going to, boy, they be quiet. Let's, they didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. And to this day now, they look at me and they say, man, Corey, man, you used to tell us that when you was, you know, you used to tell us, hey, I'm not going to be like this. This is just a pit stop for me. And they was like, boy, you've been getting high for so long, man. You've been getting high over 15 years. How are you going to, you know, how are you going to stop? Like, they never believed that I was not going to not do a, drugs anymore. What a testimony. Yes. What a testimony. Absolutely. And now you're doing something that you probably never thought you would do as well. So I see that banner behind you. Tell us a little bit about that and what's going on. Yeah, that's my banner for the One Heart Project, who I'm with, the organization that I'm with now. And what I do is now I go in and I 
mentor and I facilitate a nine core curriculum program about commitment, leadership, perseverance, and teamwork. It's a nine core value that I teach the kids. And that's what I do now. And I also get other mentors to come in to help men mentor the mentees that we have. That's so awesome. Like a, like a facilitator or coordinator, a mentor coordinator as well. And what age group is this? This is from ages from, in the JDC, that's from 10 to, uh, say, 18. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And that's needed. It's very well needed. Do you see a lot of yourself in some of these kids? I always tell these kids I am them. I, mm -hmm. I see myself in them kids. And that's the beauty of it because when I was out here doing the things that I was doing, I always wanted to help the youth. Mm -hmm. I've always did that even coming up because my, my kids had friends and they would all come over and I was still a kind person. I was just doing, I was just doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, but my heart was still big. My heart was still kind. I was still loving. I was still, that's why I couldn't even be a great drug dealer is because I was too nice. <laughs> I, I was for real like I was you didn't too want to nice. go cut off a hand for payment huh right yeah <laughs> and, and I was just too nice and I've always took kids in and I was always helping them and even through my addiction I would always try to help other people I would always tell other people man don't do drugs man don't don't do this and don't do that you know I would always speak life into these kids mm -hmm. even though I was doing wrong and I know that sounds kind of like backwards because they say you're supposed to walk what you talk but that was always in me to help other people. I just didn't, couldn't help myself. Right. I just couldn't help myself and I would give good advice, but the advice that I was given, I never took my advice until a lady told me that I was talking to and I was um, speaking into her life and I was always giving her good advice. And she told me, she said, Corey, she said, you always giving me good advice and giving everybody good advice because they would come to me for the mm -hmm. advice. And then she said, but you don't never take your own advice that you're giving. She said, why don't you try your own advice that you're giving everybody else because it might work for you. And it does. And, it and so, <laughs> and I thought about that. So I started using, that's how it's began to change because the advice that I was giving other people, I started using it for my own life. Then I began to change and renew my mind. You know what I'm saying? Then I begin to, you know, start changing who my environment and started saying, oh, I am somebody. You know what I'm saying? And releasing some of that anger and forgiving my dad for mm -hmm. not being there in my life. Forgiving my mom for halfway being in there sometimes and not being there and forgiving her for things like that. And what is and, your relationship and, with your parents now? Are they still living? Yes, my mom and dad are still living, man. My mom, we have the best relationship That's ever good. right now. That's like, I love my mom and like all that stuff in the past because we don't never know what they might be going through that caused them not to exactly. be in your life. Exactly. And, and, and then my dad, oh my God, like me and my, like I'm finna go visit my dad here for spring break because now we have a great relationship. Mm -hmm. Like, and I got to sit down and I got to talk to him. And once you do that, because we mad and we angry about something that we don't have no control over mm -hmm. and we're mad at our parents and we're not understanding what they might have been going through in their childhood or when they got older and why they couldn't be there. And yeah, we're you mad never at know what people's situations are which is, and, and what's and, surrounding them. And when I begin to being able to say, let go of that anger with my dad and say, let me sit down, let me talk to him. Let me see <laughs> what, let's get some answers. And he came down on my 50th birthday and, uh, we got a chance to talk and, and that's when we start building our new relationship, you it's know, never and, too late. and, and we got a great relationship and now I understand. And now I look at it and I was mad for no reason. You know, I, I was really mad for no reason. He had things going on in his life. You know, we don't, we don't really choose to, you know, we can't help what our parents done, but right. once you realize what they was going on in their life, then, Okay, yeah, they should have been there. Yeah, they're your first mentors. They're the first one that's supposed to be teaching things. I get that. But when we get up to a certain age, we make our own choices. And the choices that we start making then, 
that's on us. That ain't on them. We can't that's blame right. them anymore. You cannot blame anybody else for your own actions. That's correct. Right. Or use and it as an excuse. That's right. Or using it as an excuse. So we have a great relationship. Me and my mom has the best relationship. Me and my dad have a great relationship. And and all my and all my kids, they're in their life. And it's good to see. And it's just something that God had me go through in my life. Because he knew at the point of time that he was going to bring me out. And he I did. was going to be sitting here being able to be used for him to guide me to be able to teach somebody else something and be there for somebody else that went through the same thing I went through to give them hope and saying, hey, look, I've been through that. Right. I've been through that without having a dad. I've been, I struggle with drugs. I struggle with alcohol. And it might not be drugs or alcohol that they might have been struggling with. But it's a struggle. Right. And you said that you, you never went to prison, but you did a little bit of county jail time. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, with the county jail, because, you know, as a youngster or even mm -hmm. when I was even an adult, you know, I, I had a DUI. And I'm driving drunk and I'm trying to outrace the police. So I had a, <laughs> <laughs> so, so listen, I had a DUI. And after that, I didn't have no driver's license no more. So I would be going to jail for, you know, staying out late, drunk, high, driving around with no driving license, getting pulled over, things like that. So I got so many driving on suspended that, you know, I had to do some time. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't nothing, you know, I didn't do no hard crimes or kill anybody or do any things like that, but it's just like drugs would cause you to make bad decisions alcohol would make cause you to make bad decisions and i wasn't making great decisions you know I, I wasn't making good decisions well and and that's true and that's exactly what happens and and sometimes you find yourself uh you know if you if you take the drugs and alcohol out you can still find yourself in situations that cause you to make decisions that you're not proud of either through financial issues depression unhappiness, uh, just anything that could be a trigger can cause somebody to make a bad choice that they can't get away from. And you, you had right. mentioned St. Louis and the gangs and, and things like that. How did you get away from that? Because I went to Job Corps and it was only for a year. So after I, got my, after I did my year and I got disappointed because I got a trade, but I couldn't pass my GED. Right. I, I couldn't pass it. So after the year, I'm like, okay, well, I'm gone. Give me my money that you were supposed to give so me. So you completely the moved from the area. Yeah. I came back that, to that Topeka. separated you from it. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and uh so that's that's what caused me to leave St. Louis. But then I came, learned a lot there, and I brought it back here. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, I no matter what here. happens to you, you can never lose your education you know, right. your experience, you still have that. So even though you are not in that arena anymore, you can use that experience and that edu education that you had to move forward to help others. Right. And also right. to help you remember what it was like so that you don't go back. Yes. Yeah, so, right. And that's absolutely yeah. right. And, and I also want to say this too, and for everybody out there is that people might think that it's a bad thing about using drugs and it is a bad thing, but I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of what I've done and, and, the road that, and the road that I had to take because the journey that I took was a purpose journey for me to, for God to bring me out so he can show somebody else that, look, if you never give up, no matter what you're doing, the, 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 the days might be dark. You might see yourself in this situation, but don't ever give up. Perseverance, always right. push through always have hope and Absolutely. through my struggles through my struggles and my drug addiction and my alcoholism and me messing with this girl and the women and all this i never gave up on myself i always told myself i know that i'm better than this i know that this ain't the end of my life i know this is not what i'm supposed to be I gave up and i would always speak those things as though they were as though they were mm -hmm. and i was still even though i was doing the negative things I always spoke positive, like I know, and get on. I got on my knees and I prayed and I asked God, like God, how long are you gonna keep me here? Like I know you're gonna bring me out. I know that there's something better, and I just never gave up or gave hope. 
see a lot of us lose hope because of the situation and we can't seem we can't see a way out. So we just give up and say, this is my life. This is what I'm going to be. So I'm not going to think right. about anything else. I'm exactly. going to just think about getting high and getting drunk because you I don't see a way it. out. Mm-hmm. And because and you don't see a way out. I didn't see a way out, but I knew that there was a way out. And I kept that hope. And that's what I want people and, to know. Is that, and you found a purpose. And I, that's it. When you find your why, and my kids was my why, and I had to really wake up. I, I really had to wake up and I had to say, man, I got these kids out here and if I don't get it right, then they're going to go in that same cycle as right. what my dad did to me. And I'm not allowing that to happen. I'm breaking that you. generational code, curse. Right. I'm going to break Good that curse. And I did. And now it's just a, such a beautiful thing. All my kids, man, like I seen them graduate. Mm-hmm. You know, I got three. Three kids already that's, that's graduated. My daughter, she's 18. She's about to graduate this year. My two, oldest, my two oldest sons, they graduated, played basketball, went to college for two years. Good. You know, so things like that, is show, even though that I didn't graduate, I made You've sure that they seen them do it. Right. And then I went back and got my diploma. That's awesome. Then took a couple of college courses, you know, just because now I can. It's never too late. It's never too late to, he cut out for a little bit. There you go. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to find your purpose. And it's never too late to step into doing what you want to do. Right. Yeah. It's never too late. And you just got to want to change. You just got to want it. You got, like you said, you got to have a purpose on why. And then not only you have to have a purpose, you have to find your purpose in life. That's right. You have to find your purpose. And once you find your purpose, your gift, then it'll make room for you. And then it's no longer work. Exactly. It's just, it's no longer work. And when I found my why with my kids and wanted them to have a better life because they had to see it in me first, then, you know, I found my why and that woke me up and I knew that I wasn't going back. Good for you. Good for you. Well, thank you, Corey, for being with us. Don't hang up when I stop the recording. I want to talk to you a little bit more. And okay. uh, what is something that you want to leave the audience with that resonates with them? Number one, I want to say this. Make peace with your past. Mm, make peace advice. with your past so it, so it don't disturb your present. You know, make peace with your past so it doesn't disturb your present. That's awesome. And always, always know that, look, no matter how hard that it gets, stay focused. Stay focused. Because I have these Fox principles that I want to share real quick with you guys. Okay. And, 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 you know, my last name is Fox, and there are Fox principles that I have. And there's three of them. And the first one is focus on, the, focus on desired outcome. Oh, and that means, that means if you're staying focused on something, whatever you desire in your heart, that outcome you will get. Because whatever a man desires in his heart, whatever a man thinks of, if you focus on that and you don't get distracted, then you will get that desire that you're, that you're wanting. But we just have to stay focused. A lot of darts, a lot of arrows is going to come, distractions and things are going to come, but just stay focused. Have that tunnel vision and know the purpose of what, why you're doing what you're doing. Correct. And then always, the second one is operate in integrity. Always do the right thing even when nobody's looking. That's because right. character, character is power. Character is power. Character will open doors for you because people can trust you. People know that you're trustworthy, loyal. They can put you in a situation or put you on a thing and they know that you're going to do the right things. They can trust you. Loyalty. That's good. Absolutely. And then the, la- then the last one is X. X-ray your thoughts. We always have to watch what we're putting in our minds because the mind is the real, the terrible thing to waste. And whatever the mind does or the- gets in the mind, the body always follows whatever you're thinking in your mind. That's true. So we have to x-ray our thoughts. We have to watch what we're putting in. We even have to watch the music that we're listening to. We even have to watch the folks or people that we listen to. We have to make sure that we x-ray our thoughts because x-ray, we all know what an x-ray is. An x-ray shows everything. Right. It shows the inside. It shows the inside. So we have to make sure we x-ray our thoughts and making sure we're thinking positive and not negative. That's wonderful. Great principles. Love the part about the past too, making peace with your past so it doesn't interrupt yeah. the future. I'll probably use right. that as the tagline on your title. 
<laughs> yeah. So, so in closing, I would like to say, decide what matters to you in life, how you want to live, the kind of job you want, the kind of life you want. Wake up, wake up, and I want you to believe in your heart, a mind that you deserve the best and work to engrave it into your conscious every day. So whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do in life, you focus, you operate in integrity, you x-ray your thoughts, and you can engrave that in your consciousness every day. You decide what you want. You create what you want. Mm, that's and you powerful give stuff. Powerful stuff, Corey. Well, thank you for being with us. If you guys need help uh, with addiction, give me a call. I will point you in the right direction. Uh, I'm sure you can find Corey. He's on Facebook. Uh, people are here to help you. People want to see you succeed. They want to see you change your life. And uh, for some people, that's what gives them purpose is to help others. So we, we yes. thank you for watching. Addiction is a horrible thing, but you can't overcome it. So again, yes. thanks for watching.